the introductory lecture I have prepared is uh, it's about how to reflect archaeology. I am not now talking about the heritage sciences in general, but about archaeology mostly. That's my discipline. How to reflect it through uh, its data. It's a sort of introduction lecture uh, in, which deals with the principal philosophy of our project. Our project was not meant just to take or copy or apply STEM sciences uh, in heritage domains just by simply uh, using ideas and techniques and methods from physics, chemistry, biology, or whatever in, let's say, archaeological research. It doesn't work, simply. It's, uh, the relationship is mutual, and it's also the, the, the discipline or the disciplines that are using STEM uh, concepts and ideas and techniques not only need to transform its own questions or its own concepts in order to fully utilize uh, the full potential of STEM sciences, but it's also effect uh, or, uh, when our knowledge of heritage sciences and experiences of using STEM are giving uh, information back to STEM sciences where things are useful, where they need to be improved or changed or transformed. If we look at what uh, archaeological data is normally, historically looking, uh, it's about the objects of all kinds. Let's call them artifacts. About the structures or features, let's say non-portable objects. So like uh, ruins of architecture or some layers of soil that have been transformed by, by, by people and so on. It's about places, about locations, the data. Sites, places, landscapes. It's about different kind of ecofacts. So all these natural material remains that uh, have been affected by direct or indirect by some human activities. If you plow a field, you change uh, plants, you change insects that are living of those new plants. There's no forest anymore. So we have created, or people in the past have created, uh, ecofacts as well. And of course, that's the data about contexts, associations, and relationships. But this, in general, I wouldn't go into details, is the data about archaeological records. However, in order to develop more correct, more precise interpretations and analysis, we also need data about methods we are using, about how the work was performed, and also what people uh, were, uh, which, uh, what people were involved uh, in order to understand uh, the whole process of archaeological research. And I've called this domain archaeological practice. As we will see, the relationship between archaeological record and archaeological practice is not deterministic. It's not that one determines the other, but it's dialectical. It's dialectical because there is no archaeological record per se. It is created by people who are searching in archaeological way, uh, trying to understand the past. And it's them who decide what is archaeologically relevant what will be recorded, what will be further analyzed, and for what reasons, and so. So, it's, it is not also that uh, the practice is completely autonomous. It is based on previous knowledge, on previous knowledge of archaeological record, on previous knowledge of methods, of, of results of other researchers, and all this influence archaeological practice as well. So, the, the uh, the, the relationship between archaeological record and archaeological practice is dialectical. And the results of these dialectical relationships are, can be seen in our everyday analysis or any interpretation of, uh, of uh, our research problems. And in the end, we create some sort of a, some knowledge, uh, hopefully greater than 
uh, knowledge before our analysis. When speaking about the data, uh, the truth is that uh, archaeology dedicated much more effort to data which is associated with the ecological record and not with the ecological practice. Because it seemed some sort of um, logical that practice is not that much influencing the way how the data is uh, recorded or discovered or otherwise analyzed. But it's not true. It is a, this is a false assumption. We will see why later on. The ecological record, and here I'm quoting Gavin Lucas, uh, as human-related material residues also presents or is epistemological phenomena, is a part of our way of how we create the knowledge, how we reach the knowledge, is treated as a source material or evidence, facts or data. All these materials, objects, ruins, were used in other domains, not only in archaeology, but it is in archaeology, it is by archaeologists who defined their, their status as sources. They can be something else in other domains. For example, in one very close domain of heritage sciences, uh, archaeological knowledge about certain objects of heritage is just one component. Another component is how to treat, how to consider, how to use and manage this archaeological object in uh, circumstances of modern society as cultural or historical heritage. So other meanings are added to what started as archaeological source. So it is us, archaeologists, who are giving meaning to uh, archaeological sources, and they are not existing per se. I'm not telling anything, nothing new. So, what is archaeological data, and is there pure archaeological data? Well, on one level, the answer is very simple. Every kind of data which enlarges archaeological knowledge can be considered archaeological, for it gets the ecological meaning only in archaeology. However, in order to get this meaning, it needs to be properly contextualized and also transformed. But what about the data, I have asked myself, which was not collected or retrieved these archaeological methods? And also here I'm advocating the position that such data is or becomes archaeological because data is also transdisciplinary. It trans and transcends methods of single disciplines. We can easily find the case of, let's say, in classical Greek uh, archaeology, when the same object can be treated archaeologically, and the same data can be then used in art, in, in art history, or in other kind, other other disciplines. The same data. So, as a matter of fact, it's not that important who collected this data. It is important how it was later on used and for what purposes. So, data is simply transdisciplinary. Certain data may have been defined or observed by archaeology. Here I have quoted a, a case of a type of a vessel handle, or uh, what are the traces of wear of a, on a stone tool. But it wasn't archaeology necessarily who was the first to observe this type of data, and nor is the only discipline which will make use of such data. Radiocarbon dating as a method was, of course, discovered in physics, but it produces archaeologically valuable data, which makes sense in archaeology only if methodologically correctly retrieved and understood. So it's not just the case to take some samples to some C14 laboratory, but you have to understand what these samples, um, what uh, would be the range uh, in interpretation of this sample, not just simple use of age uh, uh, figures received from the laboratory. Methodology, when actually data is created, is sort of a contextualized framework, which uh, uses, of course, data obtained by so-called archaeological methods and by methods of other disciplines. Uh, not necessarily that uh, other disciplines collect it in a way that archaeology can directly use this data, 
they can use it by some transformations for ecological purposes, or they can use just part of data, not all data, and so on. Of course, this is not happening in vacuum. There is also previous knowledge, including data. There are also research ideas surrounding these uh, uh, contextual frameworks and ideas about data. There are good practices where we can learn from other colleagues how they handle data, what data they use, and so on. There are principles and standards also about data. And this creates a unique situation in certain practice of research. One of the most important aspects when speaking about data in archaeology is its incompleteness. All disciplines strive to have as complete data as possible in order to provide the best, the most accurate, the most correct answers. However, our situation is uh, quite peculiar. We start with, our archaeology starts with the assumption that our data is simply incomplete and that we have to deal with uh, this incompleteness, to have to integrate this completeness in our observation and in our interpretation. This incompleteness, and there are several reasons for this, stems from either material objects have simply different potential to be transformed into or to enter the ecological record. Not all human activities leave equally leave material objects and traces and consequences. Some human activities are, do not produce so many material traces and some produce a lot of them. Not everything that may have entered into ecological record Pre was preserved. Some materials simply are destroyed much earlier than others. And not everything what survived will be discovered. And not everything what was discovered will be equally scientifically considered. So this may sound quite pessimistic that we are losing a lot of data, a lot of uh, knowledge, a lot of uh, evidence through all these stages of archaeological research, or all this biography of potential data, but uh, it's not that pessimistic, because uh, in the history of archaeology of the last two, three hundred years, we've seen how much we have learned in spite of incompleteness. However, incompleteness bears some important effects. We have problems, of course, to understand the effect of fragmentation of data, to understand the relationship of the part versus whole. Our data is ambivalent. So we ask ourselves always what data actually means. Are there more meanings of the same data? Okay, the length of some object or the weight of some other objects or some more complex data indeed may have more meanings, depending also on the perspective of observation. So you cannot always say there is, uh, there is very, very clear, clear, clear meaning of the data. Incompleteness uh, caused uh, also what I have called accommodation of data. When you select certain data for a priori ideas, theses, and theories, one would like to advocate that certain developmental changes uh, occurred in certain periods, on certain sites, on certain materials, and will select the data that illustrates or that can support his ideas. Well, it's nothing wrong with this, but we have to be aware of the fact that there, is, there may have been a data which speaks co contrary to such ideas and theses. This is closely associated with another phenomena, and that's teleological consideration of data. Teleology is a way of thinking where the meaning of things is in their purpose. So the purpose of certain thing or certain action is what this action means. Uh, so the logical consideration means that the data was created because of its purpose. 
Again, nothing wrong, but we should be aware of the fact that there might be, or there are definitely, some other meanings of the same data, not the purpose we have intended in the first place. And of course, one of the consequences of incompleteness was the quest for better sampling. And we can say that the history of archaeology is one long quest for better sampling. Archaeologists are fully aware of this incompleteness, some more, some less, and they're fully aware that what they are doing is a, is a long history of sampling. So what sampling? How can we interpret certain phenomena knowing very well that we have just a small sample of evidence which can guide us uh, in our interpretation. Uh, however, due to this fundamental characteristic of archaeological data or archaeological record that it's incomplete, fragmented, archaeology, historically looking, was considered as an auxiliary discipline to history or to classical studies, and this was particularly the case in Europe, or to anthropology in the case of the USA. So historians, half a century ago, let's say, uh, uh, frequently wrote that archaeology helps history to shed light on some material aspects uh, but it is history which explains the past. Archaeology is just providing tangible evidence. Similarly, also in the, in the history of anthropology in the USA or in the history of early classics, where archaeology was providing nicely cleaned and excavated temples, but then it was art historians who took over and interpret the styles and things like this. This, of course, was a consequence of the incompleteness of the data. Somehow archaeology was, I would say, not afraid of entering into more speculative areas, it did from the very beginning, but simply on a more interpretative le level, it took some time to develop its own approach. And frequently it was the approach of the history or classical studies or anthropology, which was used instead. Associated with this very frequent historical idea was that archaeology is a technique. So archaeology is a method, generally saying, which provides some evidence, and then we historians, anthropologists, we interpret on a higher level of theory. Archaeological interpretations were considered unscientific, undisciplined in, in terms of not provable, being subjective, arbitrary, that the different archaeologists differently interpret the same data. And that is the fact, we cannot deny, and that was something that was perceived as a problem long, long decades ago. As a consequence, because of archaeology, is considered as being without a robust methodology, methodology that could survive some theoretical changes um, would survive some paradigmatic changes and so on. And that was a sort of a, um, a suspicion that archaeology is not or have not real potential to be fully scientific. Of course, I would not now enter into the subject of epistemology, of philosophy of science, of hard sciences, technical and, 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 and natural history sciences on one side, and humanities and social sciences on the other side. One thing is definitely sure, when you are researching humans and uh, the works of humans, like mm, starting from the primitive tools to literary history and art history, uh, the position of a researcher could not, is not, and can't be as objective, as, as neutral as in uh, naturalist sciences. Simply, uh, not that this is the disadvantage of humanities, but it's actually the condition uh, which makes humanities possible in the first place, that the interpreter is actively engaged in seeing, understanding, analyzing, and creating, in, of course, metaphorically, evidence. 
Archaeology, as I have said, was fully aware. And in a certain period, uh, archaeologists which studied the nature of archaeological research dedicated uh, quite a lot of efforts of understanding the data in archaeology because they wanted to go back to the first step. And the most typical case is uh, uh, that by David Clark and his seminal book, uh, Analytical Archaeology from 68, which, in which he actually had to define archaeological data from the scratch. He defined it through his, I would say, invention of archaeological entities, through the ways how these entities are defined, described, and how they act together. Here are listed his famous seven entities in archaeology, uh, which is simply sort of a hierarchical structure from the smallest particle that's an attribute to the largest aggregate of attributes, the cultural techno complex. He genuinely wanted to restructure archaeology in a way that data can be used in a way similar to natural science. So our facts are artifacts. So that's something that you can measure, that's tangible, you can describe in, let's say, as much as possible objective form, and you can describe the attributes, parts of the artifact. And then he goes on and said which parts of artifact, which attributes are uh, interesting for certain domains of archaeological analysis and knowledge, for classification or taxonomy, for higher level theorizing, and so on. This was actually a return to the roots. Before him, archaeologists did not really ask themselves about the nature of their data. They have accept accepted this premise of incompleteness, and they have tried to, to overcome this shortcoming by let's say, some of them by investing more effort in more speculative interpretations, like in much of cultural history approach, when historical models of, of uh, interpretations were used. Some other actually, let's say, develop uh, something that can be called new antiquarianism, so taxonomy, sorting, grouping of artifacts into some groups, hopefully meaningful groups, without really attempting any deeper social analysis or symbolism or whatever. But it was the 60s when archaeologists really asked themselves, what is our data? And uh, David Clark was one who did this in the most explicit way. Uh, basically, his six or seven hundred pages long book from 68 is about how to reconstruct archaeology uh, and how to reconstruct the concept of archaeological data. Parallelly with him, there was another, on a similar basis, um, attempt in the USA, in the US archaeology, especially what they called middle range theory. As a mean, the theory, as a mean for testing for making testable hypotheses in archaeology, something that seemed almost impossible and imaginable to, pro to produce hypotheses which can be tested, like in physics or chemistry, was of course something that was completely new. We will not go uh, into whether they succeeded or not, but the fact remains that probably the American New Archaeology studied the nature of archaeological data the most of all approaches in archaeology. Studied how, what is the range of information you can get from data, how you collect the data, how you, how you uh, produce meaningful groups of data, and so on. And it's not a surprise that uh, modern sampling in archaeology, modern sampling theories in archaeology and practices were actually born in American new archaeology. Uh, we just later on took some sampling strategies as granted because they have been used for decades, not really asking ourselves where 
those sampling strategies were developed, for what purpose, and, and, and how they proved in the, in the original context. So this middle-range theory was seen as the most important part of ecological reasoning because they imagined or they pro proposed uh, that there are certain regularities in human behavior which are simply timeless or universal. They appear in modern context as well they have appeared in the past. And that these regularities in human behavior produce similar material patterns or material traces, uh, produce similar sites, if I would like, if I would to be very direct. So, because we can observe these regularities of human behavior in observable context, like in ethnographic, anthropological context today, uh, we can understand what sort of dynamic uh, produced, was behind and produced this. What, and, and we can see what data we could collect observing, let's say, uh, um, archaeology in action in modern context, in order to, to know what data to look for in the real archaeological site. Again, the crucial part of this assumption that human behavior is patterned and is that certain patterns are universal, that transcend the time, transcend cultures, transcend social domains, um, and that careful consideration of what we will observe means careful definition what, of what data is important for us, what data is hope, will hopefully provide us uh, this uh, better understanding of the patterns, uh, and what data ultimately to then collect in a real archaeological situation. Uh, again, I repeat, probably the, the best studied uh, aspect of archaeological data is the one that has been done in the mostly 70s in the American New Archaeology. No other school repeated so intensive studying of data, of sampling, of, of sampling on different, different levels. Well, the success of these two, what would I say, parallel developments of uh, actualizing the importance of data and the, the, the definition and structure of data archaeology was, uh, well, mixed success. Some aspects simply enter the archaeological methods and are now almost unquestionable. We do not question them. Some simply died out because they proved um, impossible or actually they proved um, tautological and so on. However, what the modern current archaeology is still living on the concepts of data that have been illustrated by the horizons defined by David Clark and uh, also new archaeology. Despite of, uh, let's say, some changes in, in paradigms, uh, some changes in general approach in archaeology, the, the move from the so-called hard and scientific archaeology or processual archaeology to post-processual archaeology, no one really studied problems of data in archaeology. Most of these changes were uh, dealing with data in a way, all right, we don't look this data, we look other kind of data, because we don't do any more so much uh, analysis of past economy, past subsistence, and so on. We do symbolism, we do social action, we do other kinds of uh, softer concepts. So normally, you would then look for other kinds of data. But no one really studied the data uh, so in such a detail than they did in 60s and 70s, and we are still living on this kind of concept. What became important in the last 20 years is another aspect, and that is how current practice is actually affecting the situation with data in archaeology. We have realized that in the last 20 years, some 95% of all archaeological field research 
is made in preventive archaeology. So basically, the 95% of data, roughly said, at least field data, is coming from research which is not very typical or it's not as complete as, let's say, research for the academic purpose. This also produced another phenomena that archaeology is becoming data-driven discipline. Most of the new sites are found through preventive archaeology, not by uh, academic research or by carefully planning where we will look for new sites, but they are, uh, they are coming out because there are other activities of people which generate the demand for ecological research, uh, which then reveals new sites. And conditions of preventive archaeology are highly challenged. On the left side, you can see academic archaeology or research-oriented archaeology, and then we have a preventive archaeology. In the academic context, a researcher chooses what he or she will research. In preventive archaeology, there are very limited research choices. You simply go there when there is a need to react in order to protect uh, archaeological heritage and archaeological data. But then, look at this. This is also important. The decisions archaeologists make here have much greater economic and social weights in decision-making than compared to the academic research. If, in preventive context, an ecologist decides or, or advocates certain interpretations, that might have quite a substantial financial and other consequences compared to, let's say, similar arguments posed in uh, academic sector. However, since preventive archaeology acts on a slightly different organizational principles, there is much greater tendency toward efficiency in routine. So, while in, in academic sector there is a tendency towards experimenting and development, I would not dwell on this difference. I would just want to say that we have faced in the last two or three decades a series of new issues not faced before, which are directly associated with data. One is massive accumulation of new data for two major reasons. One is massive spatial development and changes in legislation which require obligatory archaeological research. The other one was, of course, the use of digital technologies where data uh, is produced or, let's say, the way how it's retrieved or stored or transformed, it's, it's, it's done in a much cheaper, much faster uh, way. So, if we look at the number of archaeological activities, let's say, in 80s and today, the changes of the order of magnitude, of the second or third order of magnitude. In Slovenia in the 80s, there were about 50 to 60 researches uh, a year in 80s. Today, there are about 600 annually. So, you can imagine uh, how much new data comes through this. And of course, excavations in the 80s, virtually with no computing support, produce certain amount of data that was recorded, stored in various types of forms as text, as, as some sort of tabular data, as conventional analog photography and so on. Today, on the similar site, similar size of site, similar complex of site, complexity of site would produce few orders of magnitude of data. Not just because we can take photos much easily, but because we observe many new things compared to what was observed in the 80s. However, unreflected routinization and automatization of data retrieval and analysis produced something that I, was, I called new techniques for old questions. The what for, why we are collecting this data, is simply lagging behind how. So it's, the question is how to collect uh, as much as data as possible in the in, in shortest time as possible. But then the question why I'm doing this, for what for I'm doing this, is simply remain unanswered or 
or answered in a rather incomplete way because everyone else is doing, because they told me to do so, and so on. And of course, there is also a problem uh, in contextualizing and including new types of data due to its tendency towards experimenting and development in academic domain. Archaeology produces also new types of data, uh, which uh, in many cases prove essential for understanding at least certain aspects of archaeological records, but it takes time it takes time for these new types of data to enter in preventive archaeology. So we have, in a way, a large dynamism in terms of activities, but some sort of conservative attitude when we look at the way how those activities are uh, conducted, uh, also with data in mind. So to summarize what I said today as an introduction into data force, as I have said, archaeology started with this premise of being incomplete, had large problems being accepted as an autonomous science and not just as a technique, as many other sciences saw it. Then in the 60s, actually, it produced the fundamental concepts of data which are still today in use, largely in use and not questioned, to be realized with the development of uh, preventive archaeology, how the way how we collect data, why we collect data, and so on, is far from being uh, isolated from practice. No, it's the practice that in many cases decides, defines what data will be used and uh, what data will be looked for. And then this realization really changed archaeology very much, especially coupled with the application of different digital technologies, which, as I have said, produced orders of magnitudes of uh, data compared to some two, three decades, or four decades, let's say, ago. And now we are facing another, how to say, also epistemological threshold, and that's what is announced by the concept of big data. Big data is not just seeing an increased quantity uh, of data as a major problem. This uh, would lead us to a conveyor belt philosophy. So we have, we think of the old ways, but with new technologies. Um, this is not what the big data is about in archaeology. It simply ignores the basic dialectic of science and uh, research where theory, practice, and environment in which science is practice may challenge each other and consequently result in new ideas and concepts. And this, for example, happened with the preventive archaeology. Practice challenged simply the ways how archaeology was organized, what kind of data it collected, to what it dedicated more efforts, to what less. And now we are also facing another challenge. Mm -hmm. Big data requires profound changes in how we approach to data. We collect it, now we have chances to collect a lot of new data in a much greater quantities rather than settle for a small amount of samples. So the question of sample becomes questionable. Right? So we, we don't have any more samples, we simply have almost, uh, in some cases of course, total data. Then by shifting towards large data, we do not look for accurate causal relationship between different parts of our reasoning, but we simply observe trends. We do not find causes, or maybe not the exact causes, but we accept that there, is, that there are very much certain things there. And since we can operate with uh, digital technologies and computing powers, we can correlate things that in the past it would be hard to correlate them, not only because there, there will be too many parameters or too much sample, the sample would be too large, but also no one would explore this correlation because it would not find them that relevant, at least at the first sight. We can analyze bibliography. Here is the case of the Google uh, engrams, of the Google Books. 
million of different uh, books are stored and indexed. And here is just one little case I have presented elsewhere already. Of how in German language, three synonyms, one would say, their frequency through time, okay, forgot prehistory, it's very rare. But if you look at the terms Urgeschichte and Vorgeschichte, you can see that Vorgeschichte starts to dominate after 1880s, and uh, Urgeschichte is somehow at the same level until today. This change started with the change where archaeology or prehistory became less evolutionary and more historically in the, uh, oriented. And then the term Vorgeschichte gained momentum uh, compared to Urgeschichte. It's something that would, under, would, would interest the, the, the researchers of epistemology in archaeology, but with one very few second long analysis of, of uh, engrams, uh, an invention of Google, we can get to this data and we can simply uh, find a certain correlation. This one is interesting, is the Google trend analysis with big data. I just looked at two terms, Stonehenge, one of the most known monuments in archaeology, and Midsummer. And how many hits these two terms get? And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting, or not even too much surprising, that let's say at the day when the midsummer is, midsummer day or midsummer night, let's say around 21st of June, one week before and one week after, we have also the, the peak in hits of Stonehenge. The people connect. Stonehenge with Midsummer Night, also by clicking on web. And here we are speaking about the last 12 months for the whole world. So what we are looking here is probably over a million, if not millions of clicks. So it's not a small sample. It's basically <laughs> showing the whole world. Uh, we are already using big data in archaeology in different sensoring activities. Our sensors are collecting data at a really, really high velocity, and depending on, on, on the way how we organize the work, also giving us tons and tons of data. We are starting to use big data in, sens in sensoring museums and presentations. Uh, people are wearing badges or Internet of Things in order to to document uh, at which painting they stopped uh, longer than at other painting, which rooms in the large museums were visited mostly, um, and so on and so on, in order to to create a more attractive or to make uh, more engaging uh, itineraries through museums or how to uh, redistribute the, uh, the, the the art pieces in the museum in order to get best coverage, for example. I would like to end with a, a sort of a challenge. Um, one of the things that has been invented through big data activities is the term hyper-object. The things that are massively distributed in time and space, as global warming, for example, is some of the uh, of hyper-objects. Uh, something that you as a person may not perceive uh, because it's simply too far from you, it's the scale is too large for a person to somehow experience it and so on. But if we are uh, observing a larger, at larger scale, at longer times, we can uh, get these hyper objects. So if global warming, which is a change, is observed in hundreds of different domains, places and times, so we measure temperatures, ice melting, plant geography, and so on and so on. Because today we have a good tools for recording all this and for analyzing and correlating a massive corpus of heterogeneous data, then can we say that this could be useful for another kind of change, a cultural change, which was a which was a pivotal and still is pivotal term in archaeology and also in other sciences. So, is the cultural data so different 
I'm, not, I'm talking about the content of data, but structurally, so different to prevent us from similarly recording, analyzing, and correlating data of objects, places, technology, rituals, images, and representations. Well, we may never get complete answer about the causes of cultural change, but we will know better how, where, and when it works. Uh, so this is as a challenge. So if we can document or say something about hyper-objects, why not consider uh, such a hyper-object also a cultural change? With this, I will finish my, uh, my, my presentation, which was meant to present an introduction in the course which was meant to give some sort of um, theoretical uh, manual space, because as I have said at the beginning, it's not about copying ideas from other sciences or engaging other scientists to solve our problems. No, it's to understand how we can productively transform their ideas for our uh, aims and how we can contribute, looking at our sciences, to their ideas in their domains. Mm -hmm.